Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Live with Lon uh, this July 4th weekend. And I want to wish you a happy July 4th and a safe uh, July 4th. And thank God for our country. I thank God for America, and I uh, hope you do too. And America, I believe, is the greatest nation uh, on the face of the earth. Uh, and the freedoms that we are offered in our nation are uh, really unprecedented in the history of the world. And I hope that you love this country. I think of Kate Smith, if you are old enough to remember her in the Philadelphia Flyers, every home game, she came down when she was living and sang, God bless America, land that I love. I hope that's your heart, my friends, that you love this country with all of your heart. Uh, I hope so. And for all of you who served our nation and our military, God bless you and thank you so much uh, for your service and your sacrifice for, for us to have the freedoms we have. Okay, now we're going to dig into the Word of God. Yes, we are, but let's pray first. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this, the United States of America. Thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy in this great land uh, and the opportunities that we enjoy Lord, there are people out to destroy this country and to change America uh, from being the free and, and uh, 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 opportunity-filled place that it is. And Lord Jesus, we pray you would not allow them to do that, but you would preserve this country uh, and preserve uh, the missionary work that comes out of this country and has for hundreds of years uh, uh, the work of the gospel around the world would be far different had there been no America. So, Lord Jesus, bless our nation and have mercy on our nation, I pray, uh, this July 4th weekend. And now, Lord, we uh, 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 commit the time in the scripture to you today. Prepare our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And what? Amen. Okay. Now, uh, you know, uh, we're in the study of the Gospels, and you know, when it comes to studying the Bible, balance uh, is really important. It is very important to balance what the Scripture teaches on one uh, particular side with what the Scripture teaches on the other side. Uh, this is a basic hermeneutical principle. Hermeneutics is simply a fancy word for the principles we use to interpret the Bible. This is a basic principle. We compare scripture with scripture in order to get a proper sense of the balance in between. Now you say, what do you mean? Well, for example, God is a holy God, but we balance that with God is also a loving God. Uh, God elects uh, men and women uh, to go to heaven, and yet, man and woman has free will to decide whether they want to accept Christ. That's the balance. The Holy Spirit does the work of God, and yet the Holy Spirit needs us to display diligence in serving the Lord. God forgives us, and yet God also disciplines us uh, when we need it, uh, even though he forgives. These are, these are basic balances uh, where the scripture teaches both of these truths and the balance is uh, the correct approach to interpreting the scripture. And most heresy comes when we get too far in one direction and off balance or too far in the other direction and off balance. And we emphasize one teaching of the scripture and not the balancing teaching of the scripture. Are you with me? So, Today we come to a passage of scripture that presents for our modern Christianity a very needed balance. Yes, it does. So let's dig in and we'll talk about this as we go along. We're in Luke chapter 17 now. So I'm using the New King James version of the Bible as always. So let's begin at Luke chapter 17, verse 3. Here we go. Jesus said, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, 
forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day, and seven times a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Okay, uh, Jesus teaches the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. But here he teaches it to the disciples on the way to Jerusalem again. And what is he really saying here? He's saying, hey, uh, 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 no matter how many times your brother sins against you, when he asks you to forgive him and he repents, you are under obligation to do that. Now, uh, uh, look at the response of the apostles. Uh, and the apostles said to the Lord, verse 5, increase our faith. Oh, my gosh, Lord, increase our faith so we can do this. Now, so let's say your brother comes up to you and, the, and, and, and he hits you in the mouth. Pow. And then he goes, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And we go, okay, no problem. And then you see him later in the day, and he comes up to you, and pow, he hits you in the mouth on the same side again. And he says, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know what it is. Uh, I, I've got this terrible impulse to hit you. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. We say, okay. And by the end of the day, it's happened seven times. And he comes up the seventh time, and he goes, pow, and he hits you right in the face. And he goes, oh, I don't know what's wrong with my hand. Uh, I've got this driving desire to punch you in the mouth, but I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And we go, it's all right. Don't worry about it. It's okay. I remember. <laughs> this is what the Lord's telling them to do. And then in response, the apostles go, Oi, increase my faith. Now, how am I going to be able to do that? Increase my faith. I need more faith, Lord. Look what the Lord says. Verse six, and the Lord said, if you had the faith as a mustard seed, mustard seeds is tiny, tiny, almost invisible seed. You might say to this mulberry tree, be up, pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. What's Jesus say? Jesus says, hey, fellas, you don't need more faith. You got plenty of faith. Faith is not what you need to carry out the command I just gave you. You just need obedience. And now he tells a story to highlight this point. All right, watch. And which of you, verse seven, having a servant, a slave, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down and eat. Now, in the days of Jesus, there were slaves. Uh, and it was very similar to slavery in the South before the Civil War. Uh, there could be good masters and bad masters. Some slaves were treated nicely. Some slaves were treated cruelly. Uh, slavery was an institution in the Roman Empire at the time of Jesus. And slaves had no rights any more than they had rights in pre-Civil War Southern states. Now, this is, this is what Jesus says. Jesus said that which of you having a slave out tending the sheep, when he comes in, will say to him, oh, thank you so much for doing that for me. I really appreciate that. Come on in, sit down. Let me give you a cold glass of pomegranate juice. You know, thank you so much. I'm so appreciative. No, no, no. You don't, these, you don't say that to a slave. You, the slave, you can tell him, him or her whatever you want them to do, and they got to do it. They have no choice. So look, the, Jesus continues. But will the master not rather say to the slave, prepare something for, for me for my supper and gird yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk, and afterwards you will eat and drink? Oh, the servant is hot and hungry. And yet he has to go prepare the meal for the master and stand there with the roast beef and the mashed potatoes and the gravy and the green beans and the hot baked bread. I'm killing you, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. And he has to serve the master and smell all of that, even though his stomach is churning and growling. He's so hungry, but tough. He has to serve the master first before he can eat. Now watch. Verse nine, does the master... Thank that servant 
because he did the things that were commanded him? Jesus said, I think not. No, the master doesn't get up from the table and say, oh, thank you so much. That was so kind of you. I really appreciate you serving me before you. You know, that was such a gracious thing you did. No, he doesn't even get it from the table in the story and say thank you to the slave. Why? Because this is what the slave was commanded to do. Look at verse 9. Does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? Jesus said, I think not. No, he doesn't thank him. So likewise. Here it comes, baby. Here comes the so what. So likewise, you, Peter, James, John, Matthew, Thomas, Philip, and all the other followers of Christ that you're going to lead. So also you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded. What had Jesus commanded them? Well, if your brother sins against you seven times a day and seven times a day ask for forgiveness, you do it. That's what he had commanded them. That's what it freaked them out. They said, we need more faith. Jesus said, you don't need more faith. You need more obedience. This is what I commanded you. You, after you've done what I commanded you and forgiven your brother or whatever else it is I commanded you, look, you say, we are unprofitable servants. We have only done that which was our duty to do. Now, brothers and sisters, This is not something we hear preached very much in our modern-day Christianity. What we hear so often is about God's love, and he, he loves us, and about God's forgiveness, and he forgives us, and about God's mercy, and he is merciful to us, and about God's compassion, and he is compassionate with us, and about God's long-suffering and patience, And he is long-suffering and patient with us. And about the rewards God's going to give us for serving him. And, and he is. And this is the standard fare of most of the churches and most of the radio and television preaching you're going to hear out there. And about God's uh, benevolence to us and his generosity to us. Yes, all true. No, but... Uh, there is another side to this truth, and that is that not only are is God our Father, and we are his children, and not only is Jesus the shepherd, and we are the sheep, yes, that's all true, but God is the master, and we are the servants, the slaves. Remember, 1 Corinthians 6, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. And what was that price? That price was the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. We've been purchased from the slave market, uh, and we are no longer slaves of the devil. We are slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and when Paul wrote, he called himself a servant, but really the word is doulos, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter called himself a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. James called himself a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jude called himself a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because they understood the balance that, yes, I'm a child of God, and yes, I'm a sheep of the great shepherd, but I am also a slave of the master, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you to do? Whoa, friends, that's a really good question. Because if he's your Lord, then obedience is not optional. Obedience wasn't optional for this servant in the little story Jesus just told. And obedience is not optional for us. Why do we do what God tells us to do in the Bible? Because we're going to be rewarded in heaven. Yes, that's true. But why do we do it? Even if we knew nothing about rewards, why do we do it? Because he is our master. 
He bought us with the blood of Christ. We owe everything to him. And we, we take joy in obeying him and pleasing him. Remember what Paul said, Romans 12, verse 1. He said, I beseech thee, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourself to God as a living sacrifice. Are you dead? No, I'm living. Are you your own? No, I'm sacrificed on the altar to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is my master and I'm in full sacrifice to him and his wishes for me and obedience to him. And then Paul says, which is your reasonable service? In light of all that Jesus has done for us, us being obedient to him, we being obedient to him is our reasonable service. And it's not optional. And he doesn't have to say thank you to us any more than the master in the story had to say thank you to his slave. We are unprofitable servants. And this doesn't mean that we're, we're worms or we're, you know, that we're terrible. No, it just means that our attitude is we are but servants and we deserve no special credit for doing what our master tells us to do. That's what, that's what it means. Now, that's the end of our passage, but we want to stop now. We want to ask our most important question. So do you know what it is? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's go. One, two, three. So what? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And uh, you know what I say? Come on. You got to say it with me. Come on. How sweet it is. Yes, to be studying the word of God with you today. Now, what difference does this make for you and me? Oh, my friends, a ton of difference. We, you and I, if we know Christ, we are slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know how distasteful that word is in our society, but it doesn't change what the Bible says. We are slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. He bought us and he paid for us with the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross and we are not our own. You are not your own. I am not my own. You don't own your life anymore and I don't own my life anymore. Hey, during all the years that I owned my life, the first 22, I did nothing but make a complete mess out of my life. I'll bet you you can relate. Folks, I don't want to own my life anymore. <laughs> I want Jesus to own my life. I want him to tell me what to do and where to go and how to live so that I can have a healthy and functional existence here on earth, uh, as well as, of course, activate the plan of salvation to get to heaven. I'm happy not to belong to myself. And I'm thrilled to belong to Jesus. Are you kidding? What a what a privilege to belong to the living God. Okay, now, being such, we have no alternative but obedience to the Lord. Now, the beautiful thing is that even though we are slaves, the Lord doesn't treat us that way. The Lord is kind and merciful and forgiving and patient with us. The, the Lord uh, is going to reward us for obeying him, even though he doesn't have to. Remember in the parable, the guy doesn't have to say thank you. He didn't say thank you. The Lord doesn't have to say thank you to us for serving him. He doesn't have to say thank you to us for obeying him. He's the master. But in his amazing compassion and benevolence, he's going to reward us for doing simply what it was our duty to do. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful God. But that doesn't change the fact that he expects obedience from his children. Uh, I love what the Lord says in Malachi chapter 1 in the Old Testament. He says, a son honors his father and a slave honors his master. If I am a master... And he is, 
Where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts, to you? He was indicting uh, the Jewish people for calling him their master, and then they don't fear him and obey and do what he tells them to. And it's a rhetorical question, but it's a good question. Because today in our modern Christian world, we have the very same problem. We have this Malachi problem today in our church. If the Lord is our master, then where is his fear? Where is his obedience? Where is his honor? And I've told you before that the average person in our world chooses his lifestyle or her lifestyle and then tries to find a theology or a philosophy that fits with their chosen lifestyle and justifies it. You know, but this is backwards for a believer. A believer, we don't choose our lifestyle first. We choose our Lord first and his word first. And then we spend our, li our life trying to conform our lifestyle to the authoritative word of God for our life. You understand me? We choose our theology first and conform our life to it. We don't choose our lifestyle for first and try to conform some theology to it. That's backwards. And yet, our modern day church has lost this concept uh, for, for in many ways. Um, and it's getting worse, not better. Uh, uh, preaching the authoritative word of God is what we're supposed to do, and people's response should be, yes, master, yes, Lord, I understand what you want me to do, I will work on that with everything I have, and I will be zealous to try, with the Holy Spirit's help, to change that part of my life to obedience with to, to you. This is how a Christian is supposed to live. You say, well, Lon, I'm not sure I understand why you're saying the church has departed from this. My friends, are you serious? Let's just talk about a few real life examples. How about gay marriage and gay rights? You say, oh, baby, you're just, you're just marching right into the middle of it, aren't you? Yes, I sure am. What about that? Uh, you know, I'm watching individual Christians, missionaries, Bible teachers, uh, uh, the churches, even denominations who are uh, changing their position on gay rights, gay marriage. Uh, listen, friends, the Bible teaches that gay behavior, even if it's monogamous gay behavior, is an affront to God. It is an offense to God. It is an abomination to God. Uh, and in Romans chapter 1, the Bible teaches that the acceptance of gay lifestyles is a, a, a progressive state in the decline morally and spiritually of a society, of a culture, of a nation. Uh, and how do we, how can we justify? Well, uh, the, uh, uh, condoning this. Well, maybe we had a child who came out and is gay and we don't want to be rejecting of them. So in our soft heartedness for our child, we begin to change our, our stance. Uh, I know people like that. Uh, uh, we um, uh, have found ourselves to be unpopular in the world around us because of our stance on, on gay rights and, and taking a biblical stance. So in order to guard our popularity and our acceptability to Hollywood, uh, to uh, our friends, uh, to whatever, we begin to waffle on that. I've, these Bible teachers who have suddenly come out and said gay rights is now fine. What? what? They're, they're not teaching the Bible, my friends, that I know about. Uh, what Bible are they teaching? This is not this Bible. And churches who are suddenly saying uh, uh, gay behavior is okay. We welcome the monogamous gay couples. What? What? Uh, are y'all, are we, are we crazy? Uh, 
are we not the slaves and is the Lord not the master? And if the Lord says this behavior is unacceptable, what gives us the right to decide that we're going to change that and preach something different than that? What? And, and, and uh, uh, voting for candidates who uh, support abortion, uh, even into late term abortion, which is not abortion, it's actual physical murdering a child that could survive outside the womb in some cases. What are we doing voting for a candidate who openly, uh, or candidates who openly support killing these unborn children? Uh, this, this is not okay for us as followers of Christ to do this. This is not okay. The Lord Jesus said he knew us, Psalm 139, before we were even in our mother's womb. David said, you knew me before I was in my mother's womb. Uh, this is murder. Uh, would we vote for a candidate who openly supports murder being legalized? Of course not. Well, then why do we do it with abortion? And yet I don't even know how many people who call themselves Christians voted for pro-abortion candidates in this last election. What's wrong with us? Uh, what's, we are the slaves. He is the master. And forgiveness. I've met so many Christians who refuse to forgive their mother, their father, their sister, their brother, somebody who hurt them, uh, some enemy they feel they have. What? Wait a minute. Seven, seven times a day. Well, this is what the master says. Well, who gives you the right to refuse to forgive these people? Huh? You don't have that right? And, and gossip and slander and backbiting and judging other people harshly and uh, refusing to share the gospel and teaching that there are other ways to get to heaven than Jesus and him alone. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. This is what the Master said. Who gives you the right to change it and say, well, there are many ways to God? What is wrong with us? We are the servants. We are the slaves. He is the Master. And we have forgotten this in modern day Christianity. And it needs to be preached right along with the fact God loves us, right along with the fact God forgives us, right along with the fact that God is long-suffering, right along with the fact that God is a compassionate God, yes. But God is the master. We are the clay. He is the potter. The clay doesn't talk back to the master. The clay doesn't reinterpret what the master does. No. And so, my friends... Um, you say, man, you worked up today. I am. You know why? Because this is the word of God. Because we have drifted so far from this part and teaching of the word of God. And I am so sad what I see happening. And the number of men who are standing in pulpits and who are still preaching obedience to God is not an option, and are preaching the unvarnished word of God. Uh, these folks are diminishing. And we have young whippersnappers coming up who want us to somehow fall in with the footsteps of our culture. But you can't do that, my friend, if it violates what the master is telling us. Find out what the master says to you and me. That's the whole point of Bible teaching is to find out what the master says to you and me and do it. Conform our lifestyle to it. And if our churches are not preaching it exactly the way God commands it, then find another church. And if our radio preacher is not preaching it, find somebody else to listen to on the radio. And if our Bible study leader uh, is providing material. Maybe uh, maybe this person, he or she, is a national known figure. I don't care. Are they keeping true to the word of God? If not, go find another Bible teacher to use their material. And if a seminary is not teaching it, then, then anathema on that seminary. Anathema on that seminary. Go somewhere else to go to seminary. This needs to be factored in 
to the kind of Christianity that we are living today. Now, let me say in closing, do I want a Christianity where everything is about obedience and performance? No, that is not what the Bible presents the Christian life to be. The Christian life is not a performance-based life. God doesn't hand out his value and his love based on our performance. No, but do I want the Christian life to be this mealy-mouthed, unfocused, vaporous, ethereal uh, a set of values that floats with our culture and denies the clear teachings of the word of God? No, that is not the Christian life either. Uh, where God just loves us so much? No, I'm sorry. God loves us, but he disciplines us. God loves us, but he cares about obedience. Let's balance this out. We obey because we are servants who've been bought with a price And it is our reasonable service to obey the Lord. And when we do seek to do this, he is loving, forgiving, compassionate, kind, understanding, patient with us, and gives his love to us without concern for whether we get it right all the time. But that doesn't mean we should not be zealous to try. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help every one of us listening to see themselves as we are but your servants, Father, and we are happy to do what you tell us to do. We are anxious to do what you tell us to do, not what we want to do. We are not our own anymore. Jesus, help us to be those kind of followers. And thank you for your love. Thank you for your compassion and your gentleness and your forgiveness when we can't or we don't live up to everything you command us and your rewards when we seek to live a life of obedience. Lord, you don't have to do that, but you do it out of grace. Those things are grace. Thank you for being a God of grace. And thank you also for being a God of obedience. Lord, help us change our lives if we are not living where we should on this. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Okay. I don't even think I need to tell you that that was preaching. But it's a preaching we need. Praise the Lord. Lord willing, see you next week on Live with Lawn.